This morning we return to our study of Paul's letter to the Galatians, so please turn there in your Bibles, Galatians chapter 5. In his book, Impossible Christianity, subtitled, Why Following Jesus Does Not Mean You Have to Change the World, Be an Expert in Everything, Accept Spiritual Failure, and Feel Miserable Pretty Much All the Time. <laughs> subtitle says it all. Kevin Young in this book puts his finger on what is no doubt a common experience of Christians. He writes this, maybe you have been following Jesus for many years, maybe since you were a little kid. Sometimes you feel like a winner, but mostly you feel like you are an average to below average believer. You aren't ready to quit being a Christian. You know that being a Christian is important. In fact, it's the most important thing in your life. You like being a Christian and are willing to work hard at it. The only trouble is Christianity seems impossible. Now, Kevin writes this book, this very helpful book, to, to give Christians clarity on what following Jesus actually means. And again, the subtitle says it all. Following Jesus does not mean we are meant to change the world or solve every social problem or personally address the latest cultural obsession. But the title of his book, Impossible Christianity, brought in my mind as I was looking at our text this morning a different thought. And it's this, following Christ, pleasing Christ, observing His commands, it, it actually is impossible if, if it all depends on me, if we're left to our own resources, if we attempt it in our own strength, if it's all on me to obey God's commands, if it's all on me to attain the holiness that God saved me for, to live a life that reflects Jesus himself, to live a life authentically pleasing to God? How do we do that? In other words, the Christian life, Christian life is a miracle. Not because it calls forth from us feats of, of moral accomplishment, not because it shoulders us with the burden of impressing God, but because it demands that God Himself work in us all He calls us to do and all He calls us to be. Now, this morning in our study of Galatians, we come, we come to one of the passages in the whole Bible where this reality is displayed most clearly. If you recall what we have seen in this wonderful letter, Paul, Paul has labored, hasn't he, to, to rescue these Christians from the deadly deception that they can somehow earn God's favor by their performance. He's, he has driven home the reality that we are made right before God only through the finished work of Christ on the cross. The law can't save them. It was never meant to save them. It was meant to prepare the people of God for the one to come, the only one who could save them. But that raises a question. It raised a question for the Galatians. Paul, then, how are we to live? If, if God's law, this perfect law, this reflection of His very holiness, if it is powerless to change us, how can we live a life pleasing to God? How do we become more like Christ, that we might please God and point others to God? That's the question that our text this morning addresses. It, it shows us how we're meant to live this impossible life of following Jesus. How, as Paul expressed it in chapter 4, verse 19, how 
Listen, to this should just blow your mind how Christ can be formed in us. Are you kidding me? Christ formed in me? How, how does that happen? Well, our text is going to show us how. And here is how I think we could crystallize the text we're going to look at this morning, how we could crystallize its message, what I believe God would have us lay hold of this morning. We'll put it this way. The character of Christ will be manifest in our lives when the Holy Spirit is the one governing our lives. It's the only way. The character of Christ will be manifest in our lives when it is the Holy Spirit who is governing our lives. For the Christian, listen, this this is Paul's presupposition. This is all of our experience, but we can forget it. God has done, God has not only done something powerful for you. God has done something powerful in you. Those who, through Christ, receive forgiveness from God also receive the very life of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. He ransomed you not to make you a mere slave. He ransomed you to make you a child, His child, that you might know Him and love Him and increasingly resemble Him. Now, that happens completely by His grace, owing completely to His power, but it's not automatic. It requires effort. It requires that we allow our thinking and our living to be directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit, to to bring our entire life under the Holy Spirit's sway, to to live life every day under His his loving governance as He works to form Christ in us, delighting in Him, dependent upon Him, seeking to please Him. When we do, when we do that, the Spirit will be powerfully at work to do what only He can do, to make us day by day, step by step, moment by moment, more and more like Jesus for, for our joy and for His glory. That's the hope this text holds forth to us. The character of Christ will be manifest in our lives when the Holy Spirit is the one governing our lives. All right, so let's let's read this wonderful text. We're looking this morning at verses 19 to 26, but I'm going to begin reading three verses earlier in verse 16. Galatians 5, 16 to 26. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, 
let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. This is the Word of God. Now, we need to do some groundwork before we get into our text. Two weeks ago, when Brian served us so well from verses 16 to 18, we we saw Paul in this lengthy letter bring the Holy Spirit to center stage in his argument. There, There is, remember what we learned, there is a battle waged in the heart of a believer. This is Christianity 101. We have the Holy Spirit. We are new creatures with new hearts and new desires and new power even to follow our Savior. But our redemption is not complete yet. And so we still battle sinful desires. Sin's enslaving power over us has been broken, but sin's presence remain. Temptations remain. And Paul Paul captures this with that word you see in the text, flesh, which has a very technical meaning in Paul. It doesn't mean our skin or our body. Rather, it means who we are, who we were apart from Christ. Our, Our cravings and passions that ruled us before we became new in Christ, but can still entice us to move away from Christ. But it's not an equal match. When we are united with Christ, our relationship with the flesh changed. That flesh used to rule us. It was who we are. Now our relationship with the flesh changes. It's not who we are, but it is a way we can walk. Our slavery to that flesh is broken. And as new creatures indwelt by the Spirit, as we allow the Spirit to govern us and empower us, we will, Paul says, increasingly walk in the freedom that Christ purchased for us. We will not gratify our old desires. We will increasingly live a life that is pleasing to God. All right? Remember that? that so that's, that's our groundwork. Now we move to our text this morning, which assumes all that, verses 19 and following. Paul advances his argument to the Galatians. He, he wants to hold out the promise of living for Christ by the Spirit, both God's mighty provision for such a life and the, the, the beauty and attractiveness of that life. And so the way we're going to proceed this morning is by just following Paul's inspired argument, which has three parts. He's going to show us what this life looks like and what it doesn't look like. That's, That's point one, and that's where we'll spend most of our time. So what this life looks like, how this life begins, and then third, how to continue this life. Okay? So let's begin with number one, what this life looks like. And Paul really begins here moving off of 16 to 18 by illustration. He, he illustrates the differences between living by the flesh, living according to those old desires, living like we used to be, and living by the Spirit. And it is a stark contrast. He, he begins in verse 19 with the flesh, what this new life doesn't look like, what life lived apart from Christ, pursuing our passions and our desires, what our own sinful hearts left to themselves produce. This is what comes out of our lives, and it's not a pretty picture, nor does it require great discernment to recognize it. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. What a, (laughs) 
It's just one word after another piling on. What, what a profile of the fall in life. Really the, the minor chord of human history lying at the root of all the, the cruelties of ancient civilizations all the way down to your social media feed. And the temptations perhaps you faced this morning. Despite our uh, th- th- this can feel, if you're a non-Christian or you're just sort of a modern person, you read a, you read a list like this, it just feels so ancient. It feels like the, the residue of some Victorian morality. What, what, despite our culture's dismissal of sin as quaint or outdated or some assault on my own moral autonomy trying to control me with your little list. Paul's list, it's, it's, it's really like a flare in the night that exposes every sinful heart. No one can hide from this indictment. Now, we, we can discern a range of categories here as Paul proceeds. Paul, Paul begins, so, so let's just take a little tour. Paul begins with three sins of sexual immorality that that involve bodily passions. And he starts here not because these are more intrinsically wicked, but probably because they display more concretely and vividly our rebellion against God's righteous standards. And these need little elaboration. First, sexual immorality it, that's a broad word that speaks of any number of forms of sexual activity outside of, of marriage. Next, impurity, which, which overlaps, but that word highlights the, the, the defilement and the separation from God such sins bring. And it, that just by using that word, Paul gets in our face, there, there is such a thing as purity, as unstained righteousness before God, before whom no impurity can stand. Our culture doesn't even have a category for impurity. But here it is. God is that category. The third word, sensuality. We might tra- translate that as shameless self-indulgence. It, it goes beyond the first two in emphasizing a flaunting of sin, a, a, a contempt for propriety and for public decency even. And I've never in my lifetime seen such shameless flaunting of sin. Now, we, we can just go through this list. Yes, let's get to the fruit of the Spirit. Isn't that nicer? Don't read too quickly. Because all of these are, all of those three, they're, they're, they're expressions of rebellion against something good, against God's good and life-giving purposes for, for our bodies, for, even for our sexuality, both of which exist for His glory. We should, we should hang our heads when we read these things and consider how our hearts can go astray. Let, let a list in Scripture have its intended effect, okay? Paul then moves on to religious sins. Verse 20, idolatry or I, I, it, idolatrous acts, worshiping anything other than the one true God. Perhaps our, our most fundamental sin, our quest to find security and satisfaction in something or someone other than God, a giving of our allegiance or our affections that only God deserves to something else. Oh, when you may not have a stone idol in your house, but where do your affections go? Where does your allegiance go? Sorcery. Well, that sounds foreign. 
maybe a medieval fantasy on television. No, it, it involved the use, it, it involved, we get, we get our word pharmacy from this word. It involved the use of drugs to manipulate and control your mind. Sound familiar? or your circumstances, or other people. Really, it was a search for spiritual enlightenment and spiritual power apart from Christ. This is a relevant word for us. Again, so those are two religious sins. Again, stop, reflect. We're made for God. And to direct our affections and our worship elsewhere, it's to belittle Him. It's to renounce his rightful claim on our lives. It's to seek to destroy that creator-creature relationship that we are configured to live under. We're made for him, to bring him glory, to please him, to delight in him, to find our joy in him, and to live dependent on him. That's your DNA. But those things renounce it. Now, the next eight works of the flesh, and probably this is the focus for the Galatians, all involve our relationships, how we feel and act toward each other, the the roots and the fruits of relational breakdown that, that tear at the fabric of community. And even a quick survey of these, I mean, I was thinking about this yesterday afternoon, it just makes for quite the self assessment. Verse 20 again, enmity, it's actually a plural word. We might translate it hatreds, expressions of hostility. Strife, next, strife, quarreling, bickering, relational discord. Just waiting on you on your phone after the sermon. Strife, right there. Push a button, there it is. Jealousy, Uh, we, we can't relate to that one. You want what someone else has. Money, comfort, reputation, appearance, opportunity. Now, you might sin to go get it, or you might just sit back and let it eat you up on the inside. Fits of anger. You could translate that rage or rages giving vent to frustration and bitterness. Next, rivalries or perhaps factions. This one really, there's a heart here. This one speaks of selfish ambition and self-promotion that then give rise in turn to division. You ever seen divisions created by people's desire to rule, to be recognized? The next two are related dissensions. We, I might translate that indulging in controversies. You just, you just love to throw hand grenades to just provoke people. Then divisions. We might call that cliques at war, parties or groupings, congratulating themselves and condemning the others. Sounds like modern politics. Verse 21, envy. Oh, this is different from jealousy. You don't so much want something for yourself. You don't want it for someone else. You hate another's success. You resent someone else's prosperity. You don't want to build yourself up. You want to bring them down. It reminds me of a, a famous, you've probably seen it, a famous cartoon in the New Yorker magazine. There's two dogs sitting at a bar with suits, very sophisticated, chatting, smoking, sipping cocktails, One dog says to the other, it's not enough that we succeed. Cats must fail. (laughs) 
I agree. <laughs> that, that is a good illustration of envy. You, 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 you see the point. We, we judge. It's, the, it's evil. It's evil. Final two, drunkenness, orgies, probably better debauched partying. The, these, these are just sins of dissipation, giving one's appetites full vent, probably evoking the paganism in the Galatians' past. Now, Paul is going to end each of these two lists with a summary comment, and here the comment is a warning. Look at what he says in verse 21. B. And things like these, so this is not an exhaustive list. But then he says this I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the word, the word do there is not the normal verb for do. It, it really is, is a word that tends to mean practice. The, the ESV's footnote, you might have it in your Bibles, I think is right on the mark. Those who make a practice of doing these things. Those whose lives are characterized by these things. If they are, that person will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not receive the glorious inheritance God has promised for His people, that God has lovingly prepared for His people. Now, we can, we can read through this list dispassionately. We can read through this list thinking about other people. We can read through this list thinking about structural injustices in the world. We're not meant to. We're meant to feel the weight of this indictment. We're meant to recoil. If you don't read through this list and think about it, and then if you're not recoiling in, in, in horror, we're meant to fear in the most healthy sense. Think about what Paul just said. Such is the majesty and moral transcendence of God that such sins, such God-belittling, self-exalting sins will keep one from experiencing the ultimate reality that we were created for. Life forever in God's glorious presence, enjoying His smile, experiencing His bounty. These things can keep us from that. Exper experiencing eternal life with God, heaven in, in all its glory, it's, it's for those who receive this life now by, by trusting in Christ and gladly submitting to God's rule in their lives. It, you just, if you are, if you're here and, and you've not done that, or if you pretend you've done that, or wonder if you've done that, I, I just want to appeal that we take Paul utterly seriously. No one can escape the scrutiny of this list. I don't care who you are. But there is a way to escape its consequences. And Paul describes this just a page earlier in chapter 3, verse 13, where he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who was hanged on a tree. We can either accept that glorious payment, that perfect satisfaction of God's justice, His righteous judgment on sin, or we will one day bear a curse 
Because God is righteous. He's holy. If he wasn't this kind of God who judged flaunting of evil, he wouldn't be worth worshiping, would he? And and the offer there, which every Christian in this room has received, is simple. Turn. Turn from Turn from your self-centered, self-serving, God-ignoring life and receive, receive Christ as, as reality, as your, your Savior and your, your, your treasure and your trust. If you do that, when you do that, you will never bear God's curse. You will only bear his undeserved favor. And I pray you would. Just like an arrogant college sophomore did. Almost 43 years ago to the day. June of 1981. And I thought I knew everything. And I was exposed and... My life was rescued and revolutionized. Well, verse 22, Paul's illustration continues. And now he lays out what this life made possible by the Spirit looks like. And so now he describes what he calls the the fruit of the Spirit. Note, Note that contrast between works of the flesh, works, what our fallen hearts produce in in, in their program of self-exaltation and the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, we don't produce these things. We receive these things as the result of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. These are are the outgrowth of the new nature, the, the, the surging forth of spiritual life given to us by the Holy Spirit. Oh, and what a What a gift they are. Paul lists here nine fruit of the Spirit. Again, not exhaustively, but wonderfully wonderfully representative of impossible Christianity, of the Spirit's supernatural reshaping of our lives, joined as they are to Jesus. So verse 22. Many of you know this by heart. If you don't know it by heart, I'd encourage you to learn it by heart. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He begins, as we'd expect, with love, which he says just up in verse 14, fulfills all that the law pointed to, and it's exactly what we would expect the Spirit of God to produce in us. Think about it. Love is of the very nature of God. It's the, it's, it's the disposition of the Father toward the Son and the Son toward the Father. For, from all eternity in the Godhead, there's been a passionate, reciprocal giving and receiving of love and honor toward each other. And that love poured forth to humanity, expressed in the Father's sending of the Son and the Son's self-giving on the cross. And at our conversion, That love, we're invited in to that Trinitarian love fest. That love is implanted in our hearts, a new disposition toward God and a new disposition toward others. And if there's not a new disposition toward others, then we might question a new disposition toward God. Next is joy. A deep, settled confidence that God loves me, that He holds me, and He's in control of everything in my life. It's there in trials, or can be. It's there in suffering. It it doesn't change because God never changes. It doesn't change because Christ never changes. It doesn't change because the gospel is always true. And the gospel never fails us. 
peace. That, that tranquility of soul that comes from being right with God. <laughs> All is well between God and myself. Nothing to earn, nothing to prove, which frees me to be at peace. And it frees me to seek peace with other people. Only one at peace with God is going to be a peace seeker and a peacemaker. Patience. Oh, this is, this is how God is with us, isn't He? Long suffering. And, and the Spirit makes us the same way. We, we, when we're under His control, we, we bear with each other's weaknesses. We're patient with each other's failures or perceived slights. As, as Calvin put it, we're not easily offended. What would the world be like if just no one got offended? What a wonderful world it would be. I wish I would not get offended. We, we, we don't always have an issue with others. God's at work in me, and He's patient, and so I'm patient as He works with you. Kindness. Kindness. Only Paul uses this word, interestingly, in the New Testament. If, if patience is the passive side of love, then kindness is the active side. Just like the Lord, we treat others with care and affectionate concern. Goodness is similar. This is another exclusively Pauline term in the New Testament. Th this word breathes the air of, of generosity. We, we taste and see that the Lord is good, that He's been generous to us, which then inclines us to be generous. It inclines us to be, I love this word, magnanimous, great-souled. We, we are generous with our encouragement. We're generous with our forgiveness. We're generous with our friendship. We're generous with our material goods. We want, we want to be a fountain, not a vacuum. We want to be a source of blessing to others. Don't you want to be that? That's the spirit, if you do. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. This is a quality that makes others safe in relying upon us. We're dependable. We're loyal, just like Jesus. Gentleness is next. What, my goodness, what an underrated virtue in our day. This is the meekness word from the old King James, but it's not a weak word. It means this, you're not impressed with yourself. And so you don't have to have your own way. You don't have to elbow yourself to the front of the line. You feel no need to exert yourself because you're not living for yourself. I think it was David Pallison who put it this way, when, when you're gentle, when you're meek, you, you're living under the hand and the voice and the will of another. such freedom. You're, you're so secure in Christ that you can relax and be considerate towards others. Finally, self-control. You're, 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 not, you're not at the mercy of your cravings and your passions. You don't live by your emotions. You, you bring such things under the Spirit's control because you, you, you're looking higher. You're living for higher purposes. You're, you're not, you, you don't just have to give expression to how you feel. You control that for the glory of Christ and the good of others. Now, Paul's summary here clinches his thrust, verse 23, against such things there is no law. In other words, no external body of laws, however perfect, can produce such things in the human heart. One older British commentator, Samuel Hook, put it this way, 
A vine does not produce grapes by an act of parliament. They are the fruit of the vine's own life. So the conduct which conforms to the standard of the kingdom is not produced by any demand, not even God's, but it is the fruit of the divine nature which God gives as a result of what He has done in and by Christ. This is impossible Christianity, supernatural Christianity. But as it turns out, that's the only kind there is because it's not produced by us. It can't be produced by us. But when the Spirit is governing our lives, these these virtues, which bear striking resemblance to Jesus, the very character of Jesus will be reflected in our lives. All right, so that's the first part of Paul's appeal as he he holds out this promise of living life by the Spirit, what this life produced by the Spirit looks like. Now, the next two, we're going to be much briefer on these, but no less important. Secondly, number two, Paul addresses how this life begins. How this life begins, verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I love that phrase, those who belong to Christ, not just those who made a confession, not just those who are following Jesus, those who belong to Him, those who by faith have been joined to Him personally, spiritually. Those who have, Paul says, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Paul Paul is not being dramatic there for effect. This is not a random verb. We've seen this verb before. Paul is recalling his great affirmation from Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That that was the hinge of of his very existence, the moment when the old Paul died united with Christ in His death, included in that crucifixion as Jesus bore His sins, became His curse. The moment He became a new creation. The, the, the flesh, who Paul used to be, his, his entire outside of Christ existence was crucified. That, was the, that is the new fact of Paul's existence, and that is the new fact of every believer's existence. Like Paul, just like Paul, we were blind to Christ's glory, but, but now we see. We didn't care about Christ. Now we care big time. We care with all our lives. We were enslaved to sin, but now we're free. We were dead in our sin, unable to respond to God, unable to know God and love God and submit to God, but now we're alive in Christ. Now, if you're paying careful attention, perhaps you wonder about the active verb there. Paul says that we have crucified the flesh. Now, he's not attributing regenerating power to us. He's simply referring to our response to the gospel. We cannot effect a spiritual union with Christ. It is a sovereign act of God. But we do have the responsibility to respond to the gospel, to turn from our sins, to trust in Christ. For those who do, what does Paul say? The flesh is crucified. Who you used to be is crucified. It's nailed to Jesus' cross. It's put decisively to death. Now, th- this point, we've seen this before, but this point of Paul's argument, how this life begins, is critical. The only reason why Paul or anyone else can walk by the Spirit, the only, re- the only way anyone can bear any spiritual fruit, have our lives transformed, conformed to Christ's own likeness, is through our union with Christ, our death with Him to sin, our our resurrection with Him to new life. That is what makes fruit of the Spirit possible. And it's then, with our reception of new life, that this description of new life, verses 19 to 23, can begin. 
All right? Finally. So that's the second. How the life begins. Finally, the third part of Paul's argument. We've seen what the life looks like, how it begins. Now, number three, how to continue this life. And here, Paul circles back around to where he began this section. Look with me at verse 25. And we'll only look at verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, here we get to the crux of Paul's admonition. What, what many scholars would say, this is the chief ethical command in all of the New Testament. This defines the Christian life, so, it, so it's big. That's why we're basically doing two sermons on it. This is the third time Paul has issued such a call in this paragraph. Now, he begins with a premise that echoes the prior verse. Look at what he says. If we live by the Spirit. He's not talking about our lifestyle. He's talking about our existence. In one succinct phrase, Paul sums up the fundamental nature of our existence as Christians. I, I might paraphrase it this way. If we have indeed come to life by the Spirit. That's what he means. Not if we're walking by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit. If the Spirit is truly our source of life. If He's regenerated us. If He indwells us. If that's true, then there's a crucial implication a summons to every follower of Christ. If it's by the Spirit you live, then let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, stick with me. That, that verb comes from the military world. It, it means basically to stay in formation. Keep in step, as the translation says, march in line as the Spirit directs and empowers us to live lives of love for Christ's sake. And, and that command, I said Paul said it three times, that command basically echoes and is essentially equivalent to his earlier commands in verse 16, walk by the Spirit. Verse 18, be led by the Spirit. Now, keep in step with the Spirit. They're all commands to allow our thinking and our living to be governed by the Holy Spirit, to allow the, the new life we've received to dictate the life we live. It's the Christian life. It's not a mystical thing. It's, it's not a, a subjective impression. We don't just go through life waiting for commands from HQ to tell us which clothes to wear. Not that the Holy Spirit won't lay things on our hearts subjectively, but, but that's not what Paul is speaking about. It, it's actively seeking to let our conduct and our perspectives and our values be under the direction and guidance and governance of the Holy Spirit. One German scholar says, this phrase defines Paul's concept of the Christian life. Now, how do you know? How do you know if this is happening? How do you know if you're living this way, if you're walking by the Spirit, keeping step with the Spirit? Brian spoke, addressed this at length a few weeks ago, so I'm not, I, we don't have time to recover that ground. But let me just give you some thoughts Every time you deny yourself to please God or love someone else, you're keeping in step with the Spirit. Every time you avoid sin or flee temptation, I'm not going there, not going there. Every time you see one of these works of the flesh in your life, you say, no, I'm going to kill it. I'm going to kill it. I'm not going to accommodate it. I'm not going to cherish it. I'm not, let it gonna, I'm not going to let it sit in the corner of the room. I'm going to kill it. That's called mortification. You're walking by the Spirit. Every, every time you humble yourself and confess your sin to another believer, you're accessing divine power. 
Every, every time you, you set aside time in God's Word, not, not checking a box, but, but coming and saying, Lord, open my eyes to behold wonderful things from your law. Incline my heart to your testimonies. Lord, satisfy me through your Word. Come, change my thinking. Let me take this into my day so that I can live on it and, and savor it and obey it. You're seeking to become more fully under the sway of the Spirit. And, and, and I'll tell you that there's, at no time is the Spirit more active than when it involves God's Word. Be it in your devotions, or in the gathered church, or in your small group. So every time you come here and you attend to preaching, I don't mean just sitting in the room, but leaning forward, Lord, give me sight to grasp the truth and heart to love the truth and power to obey your truth. You're aligning yourself with the Spirit's work. Every time, every time you hold your tongue in a conflict or just crucify that excruciating impulse to defend yourself, Every time you resist temptation to, to go down the rabbit hole and spend 40 minutes scrolling on your phone only to emerge disgusted or distracted or discontented. So many things I'd love to say. Moms, so many moms in this room, every time you comfort that child when you're just exhausted or you change yet another diaper or you answer yet another question or you tend to yet another need. Can you see the Spirit's direction and power in that? Please do. Dads, every time you arrive home exhausted and you crucify that craving for peace and quiet and you get down on the floor and you play or you read or you lead your family in prayer, my goodness, that's power. When a couple fried from work and exhausted from a commute, turn right around and go to community group because they know there's someone there that I can encourage or serve or pray for or a leader to support. Walking by the Spirit. When you extend love, when you extend love or serve in the church or encourage another believer or you step out and speak of Christ to a non-believer or you overlook a fault or you prepare a meal or you pray for someone, you ask God's help before a phone call. When a group of teenagers against every trend in our culture gathers to encourage each other, to humble themselves by entering into games, yes, it takes humility, to devote yourself to God's Word together, you're, you're aligning yourself that video was just one long alignment with the Spirit, giving expression to Christ's life. Anytime you're looking to Christ, depending on Christ, seeking to please Christ, you're walking by the Spirit. Here's why. Because at the heart of the Spirit's work is the exaltation of Jesus. Living the Christian life is impossible unless, unless we have new life from Christ, unless the enslaving power of sin has been broken, unless God's omnipotent Spirit indwells us, and we, enabled by grace for the glory and pleasure of God, seek to bring our lives day by day, moment by moment, more fully under the sway of the Spirit. What a promise we have from God. What a gift we have from the Spirit. And what a Savior we have who died that we might live, that we might be joined to Him, that His, His own character might be manifested in our lives as we allow the Spirit to govern our lives. Let's pray. Lord, when we consider our deserving, and your giving, your generosity, giving your very self for us in the person of your Son, and giving your very self to us in the person of the Spirit, we are humbled. Lord, we tremble. 
but we are grateful. And I pray, Father, that the truths we've been looking at in recent weeks would become ever more real, ever more concretized in our lives we would be more and more under your sway, that Christ would be more and more evident in our lives individually and in this church for the glory of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.